Okay. Thank you, Michael. Take it away. Hi, Michael Seltzer. I, you all know me, and it's uh, all a joy. It's one of the ultimate joys in my weekly life to see uh, to be with you all. And we are we are so delighted to be joined by our mentors, some of our faculty, our alumni, and and incredibly our current our current cohort of fellows. And if I could ask everybody to unmute themselves and to and to express their applause and thanks for the, their new the newest additions to our our leadership fellows community. Way hey, welcome. You you all you all do us do us as incredibly pride proud. Um, so this is in a long series of leadership conversations that we started in our very inception and will continue to be, we'll, we'll continue them on our journey. Um, it is my distinct pleasure this morning uh, to, for those of you who haven't met Brian Lewis, to introduce him. Brian came, joined our leadership fellows community about three years ago as a fellow. And we said, this outstanding fellow. <laughs> <laughs> this outstanding person. And uh, we don't have enough time to meet properly introduce him, but he's an educator. He's taught at four different universities. He's uh, an activist. Uh, he's been an incredible criminal justice activist uh, since his days, early days in Chicago, where he worked with gang related groups. And he uh, we share, share him with uh, Exalt. And for those who haven't had the pleasure of knowing about Exalt, um, I just will give you some, read you something powerful. Exalt elevates expectations of personal success for youth ages 15 to 19 who've been involved in the criminal justice system. At Exalt, we empower youth to see a future filled with hope and we provide the roadmap to get there. Yes, <laughs> it's wonderful work. So let me now turn it over to Brian. He's been, uh, oh, the other thing I should say, he's since he joined us as our deputy director, he has been a guiding force in designing our curriculum recruiting new faculty, new mentors, and, and on top of that, our overall planning for, the, for the, our future. And so we are so fortunate to have him. And Brian, so I hand it over to you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our fall leadership conversation featuring our very own Dr. Lisette Nieves and opening marks, remarks from our very own Deb Secoleros from Robinhood. So um, I will begin by saying thank you for joining us. Uh, we are aware that it is lunchtime and mm -hmm. folks should eat lunch. <laughs> That's very important. And so, you know, if we were doing this in person, we would be serving you a, a delicious uh, catered meal. Um, but since we are not in person with you, um, Michael has made the offer to send some virtual donuts uh, to anyone who needs them. Um, but if you need to just eat your lunch, you know, feel free to eat on camera, off camera, but make sure you eat. You know, food is, is very important and sustenance is very important. So it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Deb, who is going to be providing our opening remarks. Um, Deb is the managing director of the management assist assistance team at the Robin Hood Foundation. Um, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with Robin Hood, Robin Hood is the premier grant giving foundation and institution in New York City and one of the leading grant giving institutions in the world. Um, and Deb has been with Robin Hood leading their efforts around grant making, nonprofit capacity building, leadership development and talent management since 2010. Most recently, Deb has led the efforts that Robin Hood has um, pursued around uh, the Power Fund, which is a fund that was created to support leaders of color. And we thought it was just vitally important that Deb come and provide a few opening remarks, given her outstanding and phenomenal work um, to lead the Power Fund initiative. Um, it also is worth stating that Robin Hood and Deb have supported the New York Community Trust Leadership Fellows this year with, with grant support. And we're so grateful for that support. Um, and so now, without further ado, I'll pass it on to Deb. Great, thank you. And it's so nice to meet all of you, even though it's virtual, um, but that's our world these days. Um, and I, I'm going to talk just for a few minutes. I wanted to first talk about the power fund that Brian uh, mentioned, and then also kind of some of our learnings from the from this past year from the power fund leaders and how we're expanding our investment in leaders of color through our management assistance team. 
Um, so first, you know, this past year, Robinhood really pivoted um, to think and, and took a step back to think about how our foundation could be much more intentional about how we're investing in nonprofits led by people of color. Um, and specifically, the goal of the fund was to fund, but also elevate nonprofit leaders um, who share Robin Hood's mission. So it's, really, okay. so it's important to know that um, the power fund leaders that have been kind of selected to date are very much focused on Robin Hood's core grant making, um, moving individuals and households out of poverty. Um, but also what's different about the Power Fund is it's also organizations that are focused on the interplay of racial justice and economic injustice. Um, so what kind of to date for the Power Funds that we've brought in, um, what we're looking for is, you know, we understand that leaders of color are bringing in a new perspective, proximity and expertise um, to help the fight against poverty. Um, and also, you know, we're very much aware from, you know, the research that Bridgepan put out a, you know, a research article, just that, you know, obviously the bias and you know, the barriers that leaders of color face um, and often leads to significant funding disparities kind of is part of the reason that Robin Hood took a stance and created this fund. Um, we, I would say, this year, we plan to bring on five new leaders of color by the end of 2021. In 2022, we're actually going to be pivoting slightly and looking to bring on, um, I would say, more startup organizations. We're still defining what we mean by startup, but we want to um, go out and find leaders of color who are representing, like I said, more beginning stage organizations. Um, so what I wanted to just highlight also what we've learned from all of our work with the leaders, um, which is, like I said, is we're bringing over to our, our core capacity building work with our grantees is one of the biggest areas is human capital, which is not surprising. Um, and we've kind of done this several different ways. So the first bucket I would say is investing in more formal programs, such as the fellowship, New York Community Trust Fellowship Program. So over this past year, we've been supporting Kind of not only your program but also Columbia's. They have a you know senior leader in developing leaders program. Cause Effective has an in, you know developing. Um, it's focused on development directors, um, but we're also looking to kind of expand other organizations that offer professional development for not only middle managers but also senior managers. Um, something else that we're planning to launch is a um, a cohort let for leaders of color who are middle managers. Because something that we're hearing, um, and I should say that we actually just held a focus group from current community partners who are leaders of color to hear what are some of the barriers, what were some of the barriers coming into Robinhood, and and also once you are a Robinhood grantee, what are some of the barriers you're you're experiencing? Um, so from that focus group, something that was named that would be helpful is a cohort specifically in for leaders of color. So we are looking to launch that this in this coming year, as well as a mentoring program. Um, and I'll, the last thing I'll just say that we're really focused on is, you know, obviously just investing in a leader of color is not going to make um, organizations succeed or the leaders of color succeed. So we are also launching investing in um, helping to make organizations much more inclusive. And so this, month, we're actually launching um, a cohort for executive directors and board chairs to learn about how do you go about creating a diverse and inclusive organization. Many organizations kind of know that this is something they need to do, but have no idea where to start, how to start, and it's definitely um, very complicated. So we've hired an outside facilitator who's going to work with about 15 of our organizations um, to help like I said, with learning series and toolkits and office hours. Um, so I'll just say that, you know, I, I think like many organizations and foundations, we're well aware of the environment and, and trying to think about how we can best support organizations led by leader of color, but also the staff and middle managers. So longer term, they can step into these important senior roles. Happy to answer any questions. Um, Thank you so much, Deb. Um, first, can we just unmute ourselves briefly and give Deb a hand for those remarks and also for the incredible work Robin Hood and the Power Fund is doing.
Oh. Um, our executive director, Giselle Castro, who unfortunately could not join us today, uh, was a recipient of the Power Fund, has been extremely grateful for the support that she's been provided through that initiative. Um, also, one of our alumni, Jessica Santana from America on Tech, has been selected. Oh, yeah. So we have a lot of uh, through lines and connections of, of support yes. through the Power Fund. Um, so Deb is unable to stay until the end. So yeah, if you have any questions for her now, you can either drop them in the chat or just um, maybe we can take one or two questions for Deb if anyone has them. Deb, um, my name is uh, Minister Yolanda Richard. I'm from FPWA. Um, you might have heard of us, I'm not sure, but we're a, um, uh, a public policy agency in New York City uh, with a membership of uh, 170 nonprofit organizations and faith leaders. And so one of my curiosities is how far out does this program extend in terms of the sort of nonprofits you all are wanting to, to sort of invest in and create opportunities for middle management. You know, we've seen, um, for example, a lot of faith institutions and also really smaller CBOs struggling to find um, training space, right? Um, uh, you know, to sort of better facilitate and better make a connection with uh, the human services sector, for example, houses of worship, um, you know, having some struggle uh, with, with creating the management structure that could support sustained engagement with human services to provide you know, uh, needed, needed resources to the community. And so just wondering like as we, um, so I direct membership and strategic partnerships at FPWA. And so just wondering um, if, the, if these grant opportunities, um, how far out do they go? And, and what, what is the intention, the, the ultimate intention? You mean for the, do you mean for the power fund? Um, and are you asking specific kind of requirements? Um, so are you, sorry, are you asking like eligibility requirements to, to kind of be considered as a power fund organization? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah. H how, how far off does, does that go in terms of the sort of organizations you're looking to apply? Yeah, I mean, I would say if, you know, I'm not sure how familiar you are with Robin Hood's core funding kind of eligibility requirements, I would say that we're looking for organizations um, that kind of fit that criteria. So really focus on, you know, and, you know, individuals and households providing kind of either through job training or housing, you know, it would kind of cover a lot of different interventions, but really the goal is moving um, the families and individuals out of poverty measurably and sustainably, so really in a significant way. Um, and so if your organization, you know, I don't know, obviously I'd have to like read and learn a little bit more about your organization to answer the question in terms of if you're aligned with our kind of poverty fighting mission. And if you are, then, you know, there's other criteria that goes into kind of who is being selected for the Power Fund grant, which I'm not, you know, I'm not leading it, I'm helping from the management assistance side. So I'm less involved in kind of that selection piece, but I'm happy, you know, offline, if you want to send, you know, I'm happy to share my email address and we can, you know, I'm happy to kind of pull in the right person who can give you a little bit more specifics on the criteria for who we would consider. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'll put my email in the chat. All right, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, sure, Nancy, yes, please. Deb, um, when I was the head of United Neighborhood Houses, which is the Federation of Settlement Houses and Community Centers in New York, which I did for many years, um, we saw, I saw often um, people of color being promoted to executive director positions and being hired. And, um, but then the pro problems emerged down the line, like maybe six months or a year or two years later. Does your program involve ongoing support for these leaders? Because yeah. it's, one thing, it's one thing to get the job and then it's yeah. another thing to do the job over time. Yes, absolutely. So we do that several ways. So we actually run a few executive coaching programs. Um, we've had partnerships with Accenture and a smaller consulting firm um, we also actually run a new executive director peer group, and that's very much exactly what you're talking about. We've seen so many 
executive directors, they get the job and then they, it's such a lonely job because you can't really go to your board, they're your boss. You can't really go to your senior team because you supervise them. So we've, right. we've been running, I think this is our fourth new executive peer group where they, and we actually have an outside facilitator lead it because we really want it to be a safe space. Um, and then we also offer a kind of one-off managed like paid grants. So if, if there's a leader who needs like financial training or financial support, like we would help cover the cost for that. So we we definitely very much support executive directors. I was bring, focusing on, on the middle managers because something that we've just heard in the field is that there's just not a lot of investment. I mean, I think in the nonprofit sector in general, there's just not a lot of resources that go to growing middle manager staff. And if you don't grow it, then how can you know middle manager ultimately become a senior leader? So that's why I was emphasizing kind of the middle manager, but we definitely support senior management positions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy and Yolanda for those fantastic questions. Um, I want to thank Deb one more time for coming to join us for this conversation. Thank you, Deb. Of course. Well, so nice to meet all of you. And thank you for letting me share a little bit about uh, Robin Hood and our work. So um, Deb has been gracious enough to drop her email in the chat box. So please uh, take advantage of that. Um, and like I said, Deb is not able to stay with us for the entire conversation, but uh, you now have her email. So um, <laughs> <need> to. <laughs> exactly. Great. Thank Thanks. you so much, Brian. Thank you, everybody. Um, so now it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce um, someone who is very special to me, uh, who uh, back when I was a fellow, way back in, I heard we have someone from the 2018 cohort here. I was in the, I was in the spring 2018. I think they were in the fall. Um, uh, I had the great honor of being introduced to Dr. Lisa Nieves through the Strength Founder session, uh, <laughs> through the New York Community Trust Leadership Fellows. At the time, um, Dr. Nieves said, I'm not working with any mentees from this session. And I said, but I have to have you as a mentor. <laughs> you're too phenomenal. You're too incredible. And she was like, okay, Brian, okay. You work with Exalt. I know you're executive director. I think I'll, I'll give you a pass and I'll, I'll, I'll work with you. So I'm so grateful that she offered her support. I just want to give you a few highlights from her uh, bio as well um, so that you know how prestigious she is um, as a leader. Uh, Dr. Nevis is currently the president of the Fund for the City of New York an institution charged with developing and helping to implement innovations in policy programs, practices, and technology in order to advance the functioning of government and nonprofit organizations in NYC and beyond. Um, she has been a professor at NYU Steinhardt, where she co-led the design and implementation of a new doctoral program in leadership and innovation and taught organizational theory and behavior around educational policy analysis. She holds a BA from Brooklyn College, a BA MA from the University of Oxford, an MPA from the Woodrow Wilson School of Princeton University, and a doctorate with distinction in higher education management from the University of Pennsylvania. She is a Truman Scholar, a Rhodes Scholar, an Aspen Paraha Fellow, and a Richard P. Nathan Public Policy Fellow. For more than 25 years, she served in a variety of cross leadership positions and been an experienced social entrepreneur and public sector leader and scholar. She founded Lingo Ventures, which is focused on growth, talent, recruitment, and retention of change management. Um, I will stop there because there's so many other uh, accolades I could give to Lisa just in reading her bio, but please join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Nieves. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Brian. You're quite welcome, Lisa. Um, so what we what we have uh, set up here today is a conversation between Lisa and myself, but also with all of you. Um, so again, we want to invite you all to drop your questions in the chat as they come up, to raise your hand, um, to participate, to engage. I have prepared some questions for her um, that I think would be important, you know, around equity and leadership. But again, I want to encourage and invite all of you in to participate as well. So my first question for you, Lisa, um, can you just start by, I mean, I, I talked a little bit about the Fund for the City of New York in your bio, but can you tell us a little bit more about what the Fund for City of New York does and how can our attendees uh, here at the seminar leverage it as, as a resource? Sure, sure. I'm happy to do that. But, but one thing even before I do that, I want to say too, that anyone who believes that they're mentoring Brian is mentored as well. So thank you, Brian, for teaching me a lot on that journey and talk about um, creating uh, multiple levels of support. I always want to recognize Michael Seltzer. I was an intern of his, I don't know how many years ago, we, we won't say how many years ago, 
And, and I say this because this is what it really means that um, living your truth and life of amplifying work that matters to you, that is linked to your values, um, you, you build a tribe over that. And I am grateful that Michael and Brian are part of that. So I just wanted to give them some extra love in that. Okay, so now the fund. The fund is an organization that is about 50 years old and it was started by the Ford Foundation and it was a way to be this kind of neutral intermediary between government and other nonprofits and, and really pushing for policy um, in a way that would better impact New Yorkers in the city, All right. So when I think about the fund, I, I think about it in two ways. I am someone that is new in this position here and I took over from um, a position where someone was here 35 years, Mary McCormick, and a lot of people know Mary, right? And so one thing that I think is pretty important about the fund is we're probably one of the largest nonprofit lenders in the country. And I say that because that's a significant thing because we're one of the lenders that actually supports organizations that have signed contracts with New York City government right? Because sometimes there's delays in contracting. That's one. And that's how I know many of your organizations by name, right? The second thing, and that's bridge financing at 0% interest. We also do special lending for BIPOC-led arts organizations as well, too. We are probably one of the largest fiscal agents for nonprofits. At least 70 organizations are under our fiscal agent status, which I think is really interesting and unique, which says that it's almost like a cooperative that we have built, which says that if you are part of the fund, then we're able to negotiate everything from insurance to 401k to healthcare, all of those things at a rate of a much larger pool than what would be for an individual. So you can be an organization of five and have 401k matching, which, and for anyone who does HR, that's like a wonderful thing to have. So we handle the back office operations of that. And then we also elevate and run and convene maybe um, quite a few of major policy issues that happen for the city. So we highlight what we do, our Nobel Prize Award winners for public service in New York. And those are the unsung heroes that keep the city running. And so one this year that we highlighted um, that we will, uh, his name will be out there very soon, is someone who's made sure that we are not in the same situation as Flint, Michigan, as far as having clean water, right? And I think we, we don't realize what does it take to maintain clean water? What does it take from every level of policy, but down to the public servant who's really responsible for that? So it's, it's wonderful when you get to elevate folks like that. And so, and then the last is we have this community fellows program where we place someone in every community board that provides kind of the, what I call the kind of research talent to help community boards, right? Because so often that's not something that folks have. So I call it our democracy effort at its most intimate and closest level. So that is the fund. The last thing is that we do is we, we do fund organizations, but we're not a traditional foundation. We do not fund at huge levels. It's all general operating support. And most of that funding will go to who are our partner organizations. And that makes sense for us to do that there. When we function as an intermediary for other large foundations, we will fund much broader, but that's where we are right now. So I hope that gives you a sense of who we are. Um, thank you so much for that, Lisa, and also for the work that you're doing there. Um, you've made history as the first Latina woman to be the president for the Fund of City of New York. You've also been pointed, appointed uh, to both the Obama administrations and the Biden administrations in key roles that were related to service and community. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about how your identity as a Latina and a woman uh, guides your leadership style and your work? You know, it's a, it's a, so one thing is right, you can't, for me, I can't separate these identities in, in ways. So one is I do think that um, it's really interesting when you go into a space and you realize how few there are of you in that space, right? And so that's, that's one of the first things. There's only a handful of Latinas that may be heading in, in philanthropic roles. And so, you know, how do I think about it? I think about it in this way, is that every time that you put in uh, a leader of color who is leading their purpose, that could be magnified 10 times more with who they have around them. And so we have seen a radical change also in the number of people who are coming into our partner organizations. Most of our partner organizations are BIPOC led, 
right? I'm really proud of that. Um, but the other thing I wanna say too is the number, and I think we don't often think about this, is the number of champions of people that wanna see you in that position. So there are a lot of allies and others who wanna see you in the position that you're in. Um, I will say, you know, when I think particularly, you know, in this role, I, I think very early in my career, and Michael could probably attest to this because he knew me when I was super, super early in my career. I actually am really grateful that what people might have seen not as, as an asset, I saw as an asset in myself, right? I kind of accepted really early on that I was going to have a different voice and I had to become really comfortable with having that different voice. Right. And some of that came from some negative experiences about around racism or sexism, but others was just that's just what it was going to be. And 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 I'll say this, you know, I was raised by parents in New York. You know, I'm a first generation Puerto Rican um, college student. And, and I will say one thing that I think is pretty significant is my parents, when I was nine or 10 years old, um, organized with other family members a rent strike. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget what it meant to see my parents do that. And this is at the time of the late seventies and eighties. For some people who are here, this was a huge, this was a slumlord era. This was a big time of, of housing rights and advocates. And, um, and I got to see people who most would, working class folks, who most would say didn't have formal power, really exercise power, right? Three years, they were in this rent strike. And, and if anyone's ever been in a rent strike, the people are very invested in breaking a rent strike. The amount of money that, you know, we would get, people would knock on our door and they'd try to pay off my dad and he would never break the strike. And so when, and, and that money could have made a difference to my family, right? And I bring that up because that to me was always a reminder of like, at the end of the day, you are tied to other people and, and we are connected and we need to think in that way. And, and, it, and it made me, I don't know, it just always struck me as that here I am, here are my parents doing this and um, why should I ever feel like I don't have power, right? So that grounds me when I think about kind of the positions that I've gone in, right? So they ultimately settled the rent strike. It worked in their favor. So I just wanna say that too. Um, but you know, I want to say that the consequences were huge. This was also a building where, you know, a child lost their life in the elevator shaft, right? So you know, this is this was not a not a good situation. But but what but what it did tell me is that, you know, collective people with voice is man, nothing can stop it. So, thank you. I, I love that example, Lisa. Thank you so much for sharing that with us and. I hope you won't mind me sharing. Um, another way that I've experienced that Lisa has um, brought her identity and her culture um, into supporting equity and leadership is opening up her home. So Lisa opens up her home in Brooklyn to activists, to leaders. Uh, we just heard from you know Deb, you know about the Power Fund. For for many years, Lisa has had her own sort of Power Fund, <laughs> where she you know her home has served as sort of a launching pad for people who care about equitable issues. And she supported many, many people behind the scenes who are leaders of color. Um, many names you probably know and, and some you might not know um, to, to say, hey, I'm gonna open up my home to be a place where people can convene for food, uh, to share in conversation, to build community, to advance the issues that are most important to us. Um, so again, I just wanna thank you for that. And it makes perfect sense that with your upbringing and with this example that you've inherited from your parents, you're continuing to pay it forward through that work. So thank you. Yeah, but you know what, Brian, I'm glad you brought that up. And I don't often speak to that, but I feel really strong about that, that you, we all have a responsibility to model the, the pieces, the, the recognitions of others. So I'll give an example. Um, I would see communities rally around a new leader. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Oh my God, that was the first time we've ever seen a Latina or an African-American woman head this. How come no one's, and I'd say, I'd gather all the leaders of color that I could, We'd have a celebration and recognition of them. And then, to, and so, you know, we've, I'm lucky to be doing this for me and my husband over the last 15 years, but I really do believe the best ideas do happen in living rooms or across kitchen tables or a variety of places. And so, 
we call it a salon on, on, on 6th right here in Brooklyn, and we're proud to continue it. And last night, we just had one about the future of Puerto Rico with a bunch of Puerto Rican activists who were talking about what does rebuilding mean now, particularly with new infrastructure dollars. And so we feel like there's, you know, that's something any of us can do, which is stay curious and build communities um, with people who want to learn about things um, because it matters. You, you never know where the next major change agent is going to come from. And I'm just proud to see so many that have come through our space here doing so well. So whatever I can do, I'm happy to help. And thank you. Thank you for that. So, you know, you mentioned your husband, um, a great guy uh, who's also a Chicagoan like myself. <laughs> so we connect on that level. We know that you're a mother. Um, we know that you, you know, also play the role of a mother and, and you know, as partner. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, how do you balance all of these various appointments, the leadership roles that you have, yeah. your role as a mother, your role as a partner? Yeah. So I, I think balance is a fiction, right? So I just want to get away from that because I found that word extremely oppressive to me as a woman, right? I will tell you that, right? I just, because so often this idea of balance has been so genderized. I've always heard women trying to talk about balance. I've really heard men really talking about balance. That has never been in the, that, and I'm, I'm just telling you how I've seen it represented, right? And so for me, I actually would re reject that. And I actually look at um, how can I integrate it with my values, my life in the way that I want. So I, I've had to decide and I've had to make decisions that for me, it's about quality engagement than maybe the quantity of engagement, right? And I've had to make those trade-offs. So it depends on the day, on how well integrated it feels or not, right? So I will say that, right? I feel really good right now um, in my life but I'm still the mother of a 16 year old. So that can change tomorrow, right? <laughs> what that means, right? But what I'm saying about that is that it's really individualized and it goes to stages of where you can feel comfort balancing or shifting between one context or another. I recognize the privilege I have that I can do that. I'll tell you right now, I'm very engaged in supporting elder care for my mom, right? If I didn't have the kind of position I had, me and my husband and support, it would completely change integration in my life right now. So I don't ignore those kinds of shifts. The choices that I can make were not the choices that my mother could make, that my grandmother could make, right? Um, so I, I put that there because I think that is something that's come really clear in this post-COVID is just how many roles women take on, right? Particularly, I say, we've run the caring economy for a long time, right, since inception. Um, so, but one thing that I think is important is that at this particular level, so much of the work that you do is your best work is really done through others and through a team, right? If anyone says, oh, Lizette's accomplished just doing that, I work with a great group of people and I feel really strong about that. And so, um, it's really important to, to learn early, to let go of things and to let others feel the freedom that they can be part of you and share with you. And it, you cannot micromanage or overshadow people if you are leading an organization. You will never grow personally and the organization will never grow, right? I've learned that from many of you that are already, that I'm looking at on this screen. You know, that's Mike, Michael from day one with me, even as an intern, great idea. Can you start that? Okay, yeah, sure, right? I mean, but, but I say that because I think that, that that's an important piece to it because then you're part of celebrating others too. Um, I will tell you there are times where I have to pull back, you know, and, um, but right now I feel like I, I feel like I'm getting to do the things that I wanna do. And it's, and it's a blessing. So I feel, I feel really good right now. Okay. And six, it. yeah. And six months we'll see, but I feel really <laughs> damn good right now. And I'm really proud of feeling good right now. I feel, yeah. Well, we, we're so appreciative of um, that frame that you give us of thinking of it as integrative um, as opposed to, you know, work-life balance. Um, you know, we, we definitely find that, as you mentioned, um, those questions are too often asked of women that they're highly gendered. Um, and, you know, one thing that we appreciate, we had a, we had a facilitator uh, come for a session a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. and she told us, you know, we talk so much about a racial justice lens, 
it shouldn't be a lens. It has to be a pillar. It has to be like part of our foundational yeah. thinking. And I just make that comparison to say, when you give us that language of being integrative, it, it completely shifts the way we approach and think about that, right? And I love yeah. that. So thank you for that. Yeah. yeah, because you know what? I will say this too. You know, we are shifting context constantly. It, it, and so to where it becomes really hard is when there are abrupt shifts between these contexts, right? But I will say, you know, what can make a smoother shift rather than the fact that shifts happen? Shifts are gonna happen, right? The balance has these fixed notions of shifts and I just don't believe in those, right? We love it, we love it. Um, so another thing that's come up obviously, and you know, um, all of us have been struggling through this pandemic yeah. with isolation, with loss, with grief, Yes. Um, it's been hard. Um, and so, you know, we, we have this concept of self-care, again, a, a notion that probably is limiting in its definition and its view. Um, one thing that we started to embrace at the fellowship is this notion of communal care. You know, how do we how do we reach back to our ancestral practices? How do we think about yeah. our heritage as yeah. a way to care for ourselves and our community? Um, can you just talk to, to us a little bit about, you know, what communal care has looked like for you as a leader? Oh, um, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, I'd say the, the first part of communal care is really um, uh, loving yourself. And, and I do, you know, and not that I always want to reference a, a RuPaul statement, but if you don't love yourself, how are you going to love anybody else? Right. But I really do mean that that there is a piece of of you know, we have to be real conscious. You can't really give from an empty cup, right? Um, people, people extract incredible energy and joy from you when you are full, right? And then we have, and I think that's a good thing, right? I don't mind that. But when you're not, it's very hard to give that to the community. Now, sometimes some people, you have to decide how, and this is where strength finders comes in, how do you get energy, right? Some of you get energy from being in larger crowds and that fills you. And some of you get energies from pulling away from crowds and that fills you so that you can go back into the crowd. So this kind of idea of being kind of self-aware of what fills you is important. And so I would say for some folks, right, um, from the pandemic, they were able to get filled in some ways and somewhat, right? So, so for me, I, communal love is an important piece. I feel really connected to my family and to my friends. I think that's important. Um, and so I had to, I had to build probably a bigger than normal bubble as people would say, right? And that got me through. But I will say what still did this kind of communal support was that all the loss that happened. Um, we were not able to mourn the way we were able to traditionally mourn, uh, ceremonies around getting together, um, which is like right now, when I am doing events, even at my home, I'm overwhelmed by how many people come. Folks have been hungry to come together. So, and you know, um, well, let me make sure I answer your question though. But so one thing that I think is for me is that I always ask myself, Lizette, do you have it in you to be present the way you want to be? I have to ask myself that question. And I will show up no matter what, even if I have very little left. But at this age, I can't do that as much as I used to do that in the past. I'm going to be honest with you. I can't run on empty in the same way. Um, and, and that's an important change for me. And I guess the pandemic did teach me that, that not traveling for 18 months and dealing with a variety of close family members' health crises changed that for me. And so that's what I take from that. What I realize now is every time I'm reintegrating with people, everybody's on a different place on their healing journey, right? And then that becomes a mirror to you, which is like, where am I on my healing journey? How have I thought about this? You know, I realize that some people have passed away and I, I never even went to a tombstone yet, right? Like I'm just saying something even like that, that would have happened naturally right after a ceremony, right? So I'm just, all these things that, you know, probably some people on this or maybe most people are trying to process, but um, I hope that helped answer a bit, Brian. Yeah, that was extremely insightful, you know, and um, 
So, you know, as you mentioned, it's not only dealing with that for yourself, which is so critical and important. And I love your analogy of not being able to pour from an empty cup. It's also the staff who come to you and oh, yeah. are telling you, I'm burnt out. I can't take anymore. Um, and, and we're in an industry like nonprofits, which so many of the leaders who are here represented on this call are in, often we don't have the luxury of, you know, stopping the work that we do. That we got to keep going. We feel, we feel this um, onus to the communities that we serve. Um, and I know, you know, some of the organizations that are represented here are in healthcare industries. You know, some yeah. of them are in, you know, um, returning citizen services from, from jails or prisons. Many are in education. Um, and so, yeah, so that really resonates, right? It's like, how do we, you know, take care of ourselves first? And I love your, your quote. Um, and keep up this vitally important work and just keep serving the communities that are even more in need now than, than they've been even before. Yeah. And I, and I would say one thing that I hope we, we don't lose from what's happened through the pandemic is that I, I've, I've always had this view that leaders, a big challenge for leaders is that because they're always talking in their head, they under communicate to a larger group, right? And because we're remote, it almost forced a level of formal communication and regular communication in ways that folks hadn't been intentional about before or relied on body language or passing in the hallway to make sure messages were communicated, right? So you know, I actually think that people had to think differently about how they communicated and had to step that up. Um, and I think that's actually really important because you know, the more you communicate, the more you have to listen. And that's when you heard things from your teams in ways you wouldn't have heard before, right? That in some ways though we were more removed, in some ways you were more intimate with your team. You knew who was struggling with elder care. You knew who was struggling with illness. You knew who was struggling. In a way that could have been a bit more anonymous if you were all in the office together, which, which, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, but I, that's the way I kind of experienced it. Um, so just thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you. So I will, I'll take a cue from that. That's a perfect segue. Um, I will listen to, we have, you know, more than 30 fellows from our current cohort. We have returning fellows. It's so great to see some of our alumni back with us. We have some mentors. Um, I will be quiet and I will listen <laughs> to you all because I'm hoping you all have some good questions or um, some thoughts for, for Lisa. I know this is not a shy group because I have worked with almost every single class here. So, <laughs> well, how about I do this? I'm going to say something and then people could jump in. Um, I want to say a couple of things that I think are three things that I think leaders should be thinking about that they're kind of missed the mark on sometimes. Would that be helpful for people to just hear that kind of thoughts from that perspective? Okay. So I mentioned one of them, which is this idea of communicating. Just because the idea is in your head all the time, not everyone hears that. So really streamline what you want to message and constantly repeat it to the group because what you're doing is also letting your team know where the values are for you and for the organization. That's really important, so that's one. I say the second thing is that every organization is going through change and change, a piece of change is a mourning process, right? Not everyone, it's so funny, we say it's about children, but it's adults too. Not everyone has the language for mourning and how to say goodbye to something. If I came to an organization like I did in the middle of a pandemic that had a leader for 35 years, could you imagine, right? I'm coming in as a new person. I even had to acknowledge that there was a sense of loss that the team was experiencing, right? I had to be conscious of that. But I also had to put forward a sense of future and a sense of aspiration that pr provided a counterbalance to that mourning narrative. But I had to allow room for mourning, right? And so I, I say that because sometimes in change, we don't let that happen. And we have to let that happen. And then the third thing I would say for Lisa, I think is important is that the sooner you learn, and I said it earlier, that your best work is gonna be done through others, the sooner you liberate yourself and realize that it's not about you. <laughs> it is about a collective. And so the more that you can practice sharing power, 
sharing spotlight, sharing energy, the better it will be for you, right? All right, because it has to be a collective. I say this all the time. When my team does well, I do well. Oh, let me make that clear. I get, I get to shine. And then, and then the last thing is, so I'm adding an extra one, is that you model learning and you model growing. So just remember that. If you know your organization's going through change, then it's great for you to be open about how you're learning and you're changing too. We always say it's safe space, but you know what? Saying and modeling are two different things, right? So that's important for me to always say, if I have to get this across to my team, how have I modeled that I understand X, right? So Thank those you. are just some thoughts. I, I love that. And I, you know, I know, I know folks need to process this. You're giving us a lot of juicy things to chew on and layers. Um, while folks are processing those brilliant three uh, points that you just gave us, I do wanna, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded when you say that of conversations we've been having in this cohort. And um, I won't say who the fellow was unless they wanna come forward and um, you know, say who they were. Uh, but one of our fellows uh, made this brilliant um, response to a comment similar to what you just said, uh, where we were talking about power sharing. We were talking about how important it is for leaders to share power. And one of our fellows said, which really resonated deeply with me, but when you're a leader of color, sometimes they'd be coming for you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. And, and, and oftentimes they'd be coming for you if you are a leader of color um, who is being second guessed because of stereotypes about your ability to lead. Um, so do you have any insights about uh, yeah. how, how do we strike that balance? So, 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 yeah. Power, yeah. so what a, one of the things I had to do is I had to bring, I had to build what I called a private board or a group of, of people that I could go to. So even at my level now, I could still be questioned intellectually, which I know some of my white male, male peers may not have experienced that, which it, it sounds crazy, but I'm like, I, that's just, it's just, it's, it's insane. And some days it's like Margaret Cho will say, you could just let it go, the comedian, or other days it feels like it's the thousand paper cut of the day and you don't know which one and you can feel really raw and vulnerable. And so I have to always be conscious of where I'm at, especially as a leader, because I, I, I cannot let that pour into my team in a negative way. I'm just being honest, right? This is the pressures of leadership. There are incredible joys of leadership. Let me make that clear too. This, is, this, this isn't, I'm not talking about being a victim as a leader. I'm talking about the, the realities. So you have to be conscious of that. I guess I also had to be conscious of the fact that um, you, that yes, I've had to feel like I've had to be over-credentialed. Yes, right? And that there are some people who are, who, who, who carry narratives, who wanna bring you down. But I will tell you this, it is so easy to focus on that, but this is where I'm a pragmatic optimist. I have more champions than I have critics, but you gotta know who your critics are. But I'll tell you one thing, the danger is only thinking about your critics because then the rest of the world doesn't benefit from your greatness. If we only listen to the critics, your greatness gets lost. Right. And, and, you know, so I, I, I say that because when you have that personal board, sometimes I'll just have to call them to say, can you just remind me why I kick ass today? Because I really don't feel it because I just went through X. Right. I know it sounds silly, but it's not silly. This is being really human. Right. I know if I needed to call an ally or support, say, Michael, could you remind me of something? And he'll he'd remind me. Right. You know. And then he'll want to know who was that person. And I was like, you don't need to know. It's okay. <laughs> but so, but I, you know, I, I throw that out to you because that's, that happens at different levels. And, and that's why I also feel like why it's important to do that for other people too, to remind other people too of that, right? And that's the history and the structure, uh, structural history of racism, sexism in this country. That's, you cannot, you cannot build a country based on you know, bondage, you know, on slavery and not expect it to be gone in some of the, the systemic ways that it's there. So, so there's that. Um, I will add one thing, I saw it in the chat and there was, this was around how do you, if you bring a different voice, how do you manage it in a group? How do you let it be known? 
I will say this is another important piece. You have to know from yourself where you need your validation from. This is, this is a journey, folks. If you believe that you're speaking truth in that room, then you speak truth for yourself. Then you can't be speaking truth because you expect a response to come back to you that way. I cannot control how Brian is gonna to respond to me if I drop some science on some particular issue. I cannot, there are some times when you have to, it, speaking from yourself, you have to understand that that's the risk you take and what is gonna allow you that. You are never gonna work in the absence of fear. Fear is there, right? What you have to do is say, how do I work in the absence? How do I work when there is fear? And where can I get that support? And sometimes it comes from you, it comes from others. But I will tell you that if you are linking what you're saying to the affirmation from other groups, that's, that's, that could be really dangerous to your self-esteem as well. And I don't wanna to get too much into that, but I, I hope that helped a little bit. Hi, Lisette. The fellow yes. asked that question said it did. So thank you, Lisette. Okay. Oh yeah, Troy, go ahead. Uh, Troy Prince, it's been many years since your time at Year Up. Great to see you. Yeah, hi, Troy. Um, in terms of leadership, uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, power sharing, not micromanaging. And something that's been on my mind, especially being here in this cohort, as leaders of color, oftentimes managing colleagues of color, because we know that's you know uh, mm -hmm. where a lot of the people of color generally in the orgs are. Mm -hmm. What's the balance in terms of staff and colleagues where there are challenges? What's the leadership balance between developing? coaching staff and the realization at times that they just might not be the right person. Yeah. Oh, okay. This conversation of, I'm going to wrap that in the, in the yeah. conversation mm -hmm. of equity inclusion, where how do you even have that thought, that conversation of what's the point where like this person just not the right person, yeah. the person of color doing their best, but it's yeah. not in coaching. It's not the problem. Yeah. So, so I would say this pretty much as a leader, let's always have principles first because I will tell you that that's what people will be judging you on. They will be judging you not on the calls of when you make things that are comfortable and good, but when you make the tough calls, how you lay off somebody, how you might have a discipline situation. This is the reality, right? People will look at that, right? And so those principles are really important. And those principles actually have to go beyond um, what I call some of uh, the, the identity issues that are there too, right? I'm just gonna be honest with you because that this is, you're gonna carry that through. As a chief of staff, I, I, I cannot tell you some of the things I've gone through, ups, ups and downs on that. Um, I would say that there are, a few, there are a few things that I think are important. Always have dignity first as important. When something is not working with an employee, I don't care what race, gender, anything they are. I always look at what role, first question I have is, what did we not do to set that person up right? I, I, I have to ask myself that question, right? And let me tell you, that's a hard question to ask as a leader. I literally had a situation a couple of months ago and I was like, oh, I can't believe that just happened. And I, and I stopped myself from going through my own personal head rant, right? And I went to, ah, this is your lesson, Lizette. You didn't set that person up, right? Or this could have been done better, right? I do that. So what I do is I make sure I never react immediately unless it requires an immediate reaction. I take time to think about what contributed to that process. And I also have principles around how I think someone needs to change their behaviors over time, all right? So whenever I'm dealing with managing any staff member, I am very, very clear about if this is about improving, where the improvement needs to happen. Um, that's important. The other part is sometimes the best things that happen to folks is leaving an organization, right? When it's not working for one side, it's usually not working for both sides. That is another thing that I've learned. It's not like one person's happy and the other is not, right? Most people wanna come and do a great job. Most people do, right? But I will tell you, it is never in anyone's interest to keep somebody out of a charity model, 
out of a model that is not being supportive of dignity and out of a model that's not supporting the mission of the agency. I, I, I'm not being Pollyanna about it. I'm, not, I'm just saying, think about what your principles are and then relate it to the conversations that you have. Now, what I will say is that it is hard in organizations where there are so few people of color. And then when you bring in people of color and let's say someone's not working out, the pressure that you feel, right, around that. I've been in those situations as well too. That's the nature of what we work around in an environment. Doesn't mean that those conversations still can't, hand, still can't be handled. Um, I guess I'll add this one piece, which is um, sometimes in hiring, we go through this notion of, we forget, I always say to someone, who is the, is this a, a pre-existing job or is this a new role? And one of the biggest mistakes I see is that if it's a, if it's a new role, we get someone that is used to a lot of structure. If it's a new role, it's actually the opposite. There's very little structure. You actually want someone who's very excited about the energy of it being new and not having as much. And so then you put the onus on structure on somebody who has only performed well in structure and hasn't necessarily been excited or enticed about building out structure. Do you see what I'm saying? Does this make sense to folks? I'm not trying to complicate something, but, I, but I'm putting that there because I think there's a difference between the first time hire of someone and the second hire. And when I've seen a lot of those challenges, it's that we need X and this is brand new, so we're gonna get that person. And yet then they don't get that entrepreneurial side of who likes to work in the gray, right? And then they get frustrated by what is not there. And then that I see causing attention. And the last thing I'll end on is um, if you as an organization do not allow ways to communicate across conflict, that's why I love strength finders, then you're not gonna be able to prevent certain pieces. Then you're only dealing with fires where things you can deal with some smolders, right? Earlier, okay. Sorry if I went over, Brian. No, that was, it was, it was perfect. Um, thank you. I see that some folks have a hard stop in one, so they're hopping off. Um, we are gonna wrap up now. Okay. Um, so I do wanna just thank you once again, uh, Lisette, for all of your wisdom. Please unmute yourselves, give a big, Thank you, round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you all so much. Michael, Thank do you have you any closing you. closing comments for us? All you, Michael. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, was that you bring tears and joy to me, uh, and I'm sure others feel the same. And uh, um, we should rename these wisdom conversations because you've imparted such wisdom from being on the front lines of on so many issues and you've been a gift to us. You have been in the past and you continue to be. So I want to thank you. It's, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. Thank you on behalf of all of us. Um, our next leadership conversation will be in January. Um, so we're, we're settling in on the topic now. Please, you all are welcome to suggest topics. We have, we have a list already of six, of six topics. If there are people you want to hear from that uh, that you would like us to invite. Uh, you know, you're, this, is a, this is a fellow-centric model. We, we lead, um, one of the, value, one of the um, values that I have that I think is rampant in the fellowship is we're nimble. And so we welcome for you to put forward your suggestions. And the last thing I had a pleasure this week of Yolanda and I got together in person I realized how much I missed this. They, but I, she didn't, I wanted to remind you all what I told her is that, remember, you have a lifetime contract with us. This does not end at the end of our coursework. Uh, but, and that's why I'm uh, welcome to see people like Georgiana and Allie and others here from past cohorts. Forgive me if I didn't mention you, uh, but stay with us because we're with you every step of the way. Thanks so much. And thank you, Lizette, with all our love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a great holiday. Keep up. Take care, folks.